Hi, my name is Danielle Shannon from the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science and Michigan Technological University. Today, I will present on climate adaptation strategies and approaches for forested watershed management. And throughout this presentation, I will talk about other options that can help land managers reduce risks and adapt to climate change effects in forested watersheds. So let's start with what we know about forests and their role in providing clean water. We value forests for the services that they provide, from reducing the impacts of flooding, to extending stream flow, to preventing erosion, and to most importantly, maintaining water supplies. Forests also play a critical role in providing wildlife habitat, air purification, and carbon sequestration, amongst many other services. Yet forests are facing serious and significant challenges throughout the coming century. Forests will change due to rapid climate change and changing land uses. For instance, we may lose forests due to deforestation for urban areas, and forests themselves are likely to change as shifting tree habitat and changing forest species assemblages change in response to climate change. It's these combination of changes that will affect watershed hydrologic processes in ways that may challenge traditional expectations of water yield and water quality. Forests are vitally important land cover and intrinsically linked to the provision of fresh water. According to the United Nations FAO, forested watersheds provide more than three quarter of the globe's accessible fresh water. And across the United States, over 68,000 communities rely on forested lands to capture and filter their drinking water, such as major cities like New York City, Boston, and Providence, Rhode Island. Through years of research and study, we do have a better understanding of the interconnectedness of forests and water. For instance, forest cover is critical to what we call a healthy watershed, from the, the uplands to the bottomland forests. Forests help to sustain downstream water supplies. Particularly important are the deep-rooted riparian forests adjacent to water bodies on stream banks and on floodplains, which are known for their influence in regulating stream flow and protecting water quality. We know that the loss of forests can affect water quality, water yield, and soil quality. In the Midwest and Northeast region, an approximate 20% loss of forest cover is likely to trigger a change in stream flow and annual water yield that can really affect the timing and magnitude of stream flow in any given time of year and, of course, introduce more runoff and erosion. Over the years, our management practices have changed based on our understanding of forest processes and function, such that now foresters and natural resource professionals often follow site-specific best management practices to avoid or reduce negative effects on soils and water resources. In some states, this BMP are voluntary, and in other states, BMPs are required. But watersheds are more than just one forest. Watersheds or the land that drains water to a particular stream, river, or lake are really diverse with varying values and perspectives for the land. Often our management objectives in watersheds are to reduce risks that can negatively affect the benefit of forested ecosystems while still meeting our goals and reflecting our values. From managing forested watersheds for the protection of downstream water quality to the protection and the restoration of wildlife habitat and managing for the longevity and protection of spiritual areas. Yet rapid climate change brings about new challenges and intensifies non-climate stressors that we may already be dealing with, maybe related to past and current land uses. This compounded effect can further intensify risks to forests and ecosystems and complicates the work that we've set out to accomplish. Climate change tests traditional natural resource management and causes us to reframe our expectations of future conditions. In some instances, the effects of climate change may make these goals difficult to achieve altogether. Now we know that forests are facing many threats in independent of and likely influenced by current climate change and that climate change directly affects forested ecosystems, the wildlife habitats and infrastructure that's within them. 
A warmer climate intensifies the hydrologic cycle, bringing about wetter and drier conditions. So more intense storms throughout the year, a reduction of snowpack amount and duration. These changes can influence annual and seasonal water yields, water quality, and changes the timing of water on the landscape. The rapid pace of climate change affects the abilities of plants and animal species to migrate in order to keep pace with these changes. So for instance, over time, a forest habitat suitability is expected to to change, such that some tree species that favor cooler environments may find more suitable habitat northward or even higher in elevation. While on the flip side, other tree species and wildlife habitats may actually expand into new areas. The quality and condition of a watershed is very dependent on several factors that are often interconnected. So if one is affected or greatly reduced, there is an effect on another. It's these interactions that offer feedbacks that are a particular concern to forests and wildlife habitats vulnerable to change that may have less ability to cope with increased stressors. So let's go through an example. Riparian forests, locally adapted to stream flow and very critical to water quality, are often described as the watershed sponge, the areas that reduce runoff and shade the stream and regulate summer air and water temperatures while also providing habitat for fish and other aquatic species. Climate change affects all areas, but we know that not all areas will respond in the same way. So for some riparian areas, climate change will directly affect the growth, recruitment, reproduction ability of certain canopy, shrub, and herbs. Some species may be favored, while others may become increasingly stressed and intolerant of warming variable precipitation, more frequent inundation, or even increased range of deadly pests are likely to affect these areas. So let's look at a particular species and its effect on, on more than one location in the watershed. So for instance, let's explore the loss of a key riparian species, say hemlock, which is a common riparian species known in the Eastern US. So due to past, Pest hemlock woolly adelgid, you know, on one tree, this is troubling and, and really challenging to keep at bay. But with climate change, pests are known to expand more rapidly and have been observed to have more life cycles in a given year. Thus, the loss of one tree may become several, expanding to a larger proportion of the riparian area. Now, in this hypothetical riparian corridor, the site now has less shade to cover the stream, making way for sunlight that can warm the stream, and eventually the loss of a key riparian species can affect flood control, soil retention, nutrient uptake, and contribute to the reduction of aquatic habitat quality. Spatially, riparian forests are located in the headwaters and are known to be critical to the management of rainfall and runoff to downstream locations. So what is the watershed-wide impact when a key riparian species is lost? Well, in headwater systems, the loss of water storage means more energy flows downstream, and that can translate into a loss of flood protection. The regulation of stream flows that lead to a stream channel's instability and can very much reshape the dimension and function of surface waters to balance this new hydrology. Again, changes in local conditions don't have local impact. The cumulative effect of climate change on watersheds, just like the water, flows downstream. Drawing from our example, if you've lost effective riparian buffering, even a small event can trigger impacts downstream, leading to ca catastrophic damages. So as we've reviewed, water retained in forested systems is typically high quality, clean and cold, a function that's likely to become even more important to natural resource managers who are seeking to sustain water quality and yield over the next 100 years. So a changed climate is expected to challenge that capacity to, of forests to maintain the delivery of water throughout the year, and, and particularly throughout warmer growing seasons and in longer dry periods. The capacity of forests to buffer and attenuate flood flows after large and more frequent extreme events may wane. So how will long-term changes in climate affect water supply and water quality? But most important, 
and pertinent to our discussion today is can managers actively respond to and prepare ecosystems for climate change? And what can they do? How can a manager respond? Well, of course there's options. Managers can adapt to or even adjust systems in preparation or in response to climate change. Adaptation activities are often designed to specifically address these local vulnerabilities in order to meet those bigger goals and objectives on the landscape. Climate informed actions that we might take are not always new, wild or different. In fact, many of those adaptation actions are consistent with what we would think of as sustainable management and efforts to restore ecosystem function. A changing climate may compel some managers to adopt new practices, but it can also underscore the importance of sustainable practices that are currently being used and are intended to build upon current management actions that work to sustain and conserve ecosystems over the long term. So, you know, there is no right way to pursue climate change adaptation, even in the face of fundamental change. Is adaptation when somebody promotes a certain species or assemblage? Does adaptation require transition or abandonment of restoration goals? Is thinking about climate change compatible with existing planning? Well, sure, it all depends on where you are and what it is that you're trying to do. Because climate change adaptation is not unrelated to our current values and our objectives and the con constraints that drive our decisions and on the ground actions. The actions that we take now and will make given climate change are heavily weighted by our values and our willingness to accept risks. So, you know, intentional climate change adaptation planning is becoming a necessary part of the job. Yet a central challenge to water planning and forest management is learning to plan for future climate conditions that are wider in range than those experienced in the 20th century. Similarly, climate change tests traditional natural resource management and may require us to reframe our expectations. We know that one of the major challenges in adapting ecosystems to climate change as part of an intentional planning effort is in translating these broad adaptation concepts to specific and tangible actions. Using the NIAC's forested watershed menu of strategies and approaches with the adaptation workbook can make watershed management plans more robust to uncertainty and changing conditions. So using the workbook and this menu, we can pick and choose approaches that overlap with existing conservation efforts in order to help us meet our goals, regardless of changing pressures and more variable climate extremes. This menu is designed to be flexible rather than a specific set of guidelines or recommendations. And we did this in order to accommodate the real diverse land ownership type that is across this wide geographic setting and the local site conditions. For these reasons, this set of adaptation strategies and approaches serves as a potential starting point uh, and is really here to help support land managers in developing their own custom actions. As part of a planning exercise, the NIAC's menu of forested watershed strategies and approaches is designed to be used within an adaptive management process adapted for climate change. That's called the Adaptation Workbook. So the Adaptation Workbook is a practical framework for land managers to customize management actions. The workbook sets a framework to help managers assess project-specific climate change impacts, evaluate climate-related challenges and opportunities, and then supports managers to identify and customize climate adaptation tactics that can help the system cope with climate impacts. So in essence, the workbook helps land managers connect the dots so they can take climate-informed actions that are relevant to the place that they care about while meeting their goals. So you can find more information regarding this process on our website at forestadaptation.org. Okay, so let's dig in and take a quick tour of the Forest and Watersheds Adaptation Menu. This menu was designed to help land managers and conservationists integrate climate uncertainty into the broader watershed management goals. It applies to projects focused on forests and floodplains and riparian areas, forested wetlands, lake sheds, water projects 
um, that are seeking to respond to maybe fundamental changes in hydrology that they're observing or expect to experience due to a changing climate. Uh, over the next several slides, I'll just review five of the strategies and leave it up to you to investigate the remaining 28 approaches and example tactics that we've also prepared in this toolkit. You can find the entire toolkit and publication at forestadaptation.org forward slash water. And I've included the link on all of these slides so you can follow up. So strategy one. Fundamentally, this strategy is about protection of soil and hydrologic function. So a shift in climate may amplify and exacerbate existing ecosystem challenges that could result from land uses that have been formally fragmented, altered, or obstructed water flow paths. Sustaining ecosystem functions in the future is likely to depend on planning that maintains the long-term conveyance of water through hydrologic pathways, most notably actions that promote soils for water infiltration and storage. The presence of basic hydrologic qualities such as intact forest soils, floodplains, and wetlands that can infiltrate capture and store water, and streams that are neither building up sediment, aggrading, or being eroded away, degradation, sets a healthy baseline for the watershed to cope with current land use issues and climate interactions and stressors that can amplify risks of erosion and scour. So potential on the ground tactics or actions that a manager could take in line with this strategy may include enhanced best management practices that protect resources from harm while also buffering that system from climate stressors such as forest practices that help to slow the flow of water during harvest or construction and practices that allow for water to slowly infiltrate back into the soil. Another action may be related to the restoration of woody corridors in floodwater storage areas to reduce the effect of increasing storm flow and floodwater damages. Or maybe actions that restore hydrology to floodplains and previously drained wetlands to enhance that retention of water and storage of water on the landscape critical in drier times. Next, strategy two. This strategy is all about addressing the additional efforts required to offset climate impacts in order to sustain clean water with an emphasis on anticipating and preventing increased stresses before water quality impairment uh, incur, uh, occurs or intensifies. For instance, managers may seek to focus on tactics that can help the system cope with changing seasonal precipitation and increased storm intensities by taking local action to prepare the sites that might be prone to erosion or you know prone um, in order to help reduce risks of increased runoff and sediment losses natural resource managers may already implement actions that reduce risks to water quality but water quality is expected to change and possibly worsen in some areas due to changes in seasonal precipitation and warming as hydrology and ecosystems change reflecting a changing climate these changes are likely to combine with existing land use issues to further degrade or diminish water quality so on the ground tactics may be based on a site's vulnerability, but some examples include doubling down on efforts to reduce nutrient export to streams, lakes, and rivers in order to avoid more intense eutrophication and harmful algal blooms expected to increase with the warmer temperatures and more variable precipitation. A tactic along these lines is to increase shoreline buffers through afforestation and tree planting efforts. Another tactic might be establishing or widening riparian areas to increase canopy coverage, shading on a surface water, particularly important in headwater and in low order streams as a way to help offset warming temperatures and to reduce evaporation. As an aside, studies on how wide riparian buffers should be in order to effectively offset stream warming of one and a half to two degrees do vary but there is wide agreement that protecting and increasing current widths of riparian corridors where possible, particularly in headwater and low order streams, can help to offset warming stream temperatures and can help to maintain cold waters in these areas. Strategy three, 
This strategy is all about addressing the benefits of healthy forest cover in the production of water resources. So, you know, changes to forest structure and composition can alter the underlying hydrologic processes within a watershed. This can have effects on how water is captured, stored, and filtered, and the regulation of stream flow. Managing forests to reduce stressors, increase structural and species diversity, and protecting unique habitats may actually enhance the forest ecosystem resilience to increasing climate variability and other disturbances. So this strategy really focuses on restoring and revegetating forest and vegetative cover to riparian areas, uh, supports management of invasive species, and uh, taking action to increase the resistance of a forest to pests and pathogens, in addition to the management of the forest that can enhance species age class and structural diversity. So strategy four of six seeks to maintain that overall ecosystem function and health by gradually enabling and assisting adaptive transitions of tree species and forest communities in suitable locations. So, you know, there are many cases where native species may be well adapted to the future range of climate and site conditions. Using forest management to favor species that can tolerate a wide range of climate and site conditions may enhance the system to better fare under future climate changes and can facilitate a gradual shift in the forest composition to help spread out risk of future forest decline over time. So species compositions in many forest ecosystems is expected to change as tree species adapt to a new climate. Many of the approaches in this strategy attempt to mimic natural processes, but may be currently considered unconventional responses, particularly those centered around assisted migration of tree species, which still remains a challenging and contentious issue. So with that, managers should thoroughly investigate potential consequences of assisted migration before introducing new species. This strategy is best implemented with caution, incorporating due consideration of the uncertainties inherent of climate change, the sparse record of previous examples, and continued uncertainties of forest response. Strategy five aims to help ecosystems adjust in response to fundamental changes in hydrologic processes altered by a changing climate. Anticipating potential impacts to water levels and water quality and land planning may help natural resource managers reduce risks and take advantage of opportunities to sustain local hydrologic functions. Now, not all catchments are hydrologically resilient and stable within a range of natural variability meaning more variable precipitation and warming may affect the water balance throughout the growing season in, more, in some areas more so than in others. Limited and excessive water is a concern for habitats and food webs that are sensitive to alter timing and the quantity of available water, such as aquatic species that are dependent on certain ecological flows for survival. Management that anticipates drier or wetter conditions in long-term watershed planning can capitalize on a system's inherent elasticity to lessen that forest and wildlife habitat degradation and to enhance the system to persist under a range of conditions. Management responses to help systems cope with limited water may require innovation if seeking to adapt to drier conditions such as selecting drought tolerant species and genotypes from drier habitats, maybe reducing tree stocking levels, or in modifying infrastructure and facilities to maximize water capture and storage. Management responses that you know, might be in line with helping a system cope with increased water and higher peak flows rel related to flooding may include added emphasis on best management practices that account for increased soil saturation and water inundation, such as actions like managing riparian areas to include a diversity of species more tolerant to frequently saturated conditions, such as obligate wetland plants or targeting invasive species control in new flood prone areas. Where high energy water flows are a concern, the strategic placement of downwood to slow the flow and pool overland uh, runoff may be emphasized. 
So be aware that some treatments that I've described can negatively affect water supply or other ecosystem services. Therefore, management can decisions seeking to accommodate altered hydrology require careful attention to site conditions and watershed characteristics that, in order to critically evaluate opportunities and trade-offs in planning. All right, finally, the last strategy, number six, addresses infrastructure and transportation systems within forest areas. The careful evaluation of past design concepts and criteria may be necessary to minimize risks and safety concerns to the watershed, particularly when facilities are downstream of or present within high risk areas where the consequences of lost infrastructure are just totally unacceptable. As we know, infrastructure and facilities are often designed using historic hydrologic data sets to determine the sizing and placement that meet access and safety criteria over a design lifespan, maybe 25 or 100 years. However, infrastructure in the future will be subjected to heat and storm events that totally ex exceed historical norms, placing some facilities and structures at risk. Considering that full range of potential changes to hydrology due to climate change may help inform structural reinforcements and safety enhancements that reduce risks. Reducing risks of inf infrastructure failure may also benefit watershed biologic integrity, helping managers meet other water quality and aquatic habitat goals. This strategy and approaches listed in this section are guiding ideas, and it's very likely that a planner will need to incorporate expertise from engineers and incorporate other technical information to form you know, a more imp implementable response to these challenges. Uh, an example tactic related to this strategy might be related to uh, you know, changing precipitation patterns and some infrastructure needing to be physically relocated away from high risk areas in order to improve the quality of the forest and the wildlife habitats adjacent to those water resources and forested areas. A tactic may include relocating campground facilities out of a floodplain and away from a dynamic surface water to reduce hazards associated to flooding and eroding, eroding stream banks. Where climate change interacts with local factors to create hard to maintain facilities or where roads are reducing soil infiltration of water and critical hydrologic connectivity needed to offset climate impacts, a tactic to decommission roads and trails may become a reasonable action. Decommissioning roads by ripping the roadbed and mechanically decompacting soils has been shown to enhance water retention and to reestablish subsurface drainage to groundwater sources. So there you go, we've just reviewed six climate adaptation strategies suited for forest and watershed management. And you can find several approaches within each strategy to support customizing local specific climate change responses that are appropriate to a particular area and goal. Taking initiative now to phase in climate considerations and adaptation actions as part of a broader strategy can help achieve conservation goals in the long term. Climate change adaptation efforts helps us maintain ecosystems for the long term under a range of future conditions and ensures that our goals are still viable years from now. So let's look at a quick example of a real world situation where managers have considered the impacts of climate in their management decisions. In the Midwest and the Northeastern US, many land managers are coping with too much water. In some seasons, experiencing you know, more intense and more frequent storms and flooding events. And these events challenge the function of the system that can ultimately degrade or reduce the quality of forest habitat and water quality. Therefore, managers are finding ways to slow the flow and take actions that can leverage natural systems like forests and wetlands. Others are incorporating these considerations into infrastructure planning and design, particularly to buffer high value assets, you know, especially where access is needed during extreme events. In this example, on the Schwamigan Nicolay Forest, some specialists on the forest wanted to improve the overall in-stream habitat quality and passage for aquatic organisms, while also reducing erosion and sedimentation. 
They were dealing with aging infrastructure that needed maintenance and redesign anyways. And then came climate change, <laughs> sort of. The group of specialists decided to additionally consider the potential of more severe storms and growing season lower low flows finding the infrastructure that they managed was at risk of failure or might greatly reduce the passage of, aqu of aquatic organisms given these potential changes. So using the adaptation workbook to better understand the site's vulnerability and to evaluate you know, expectations of meeting their goals over the long term, the group customized adaptation tactics to actually redesign a replacement culvert that may withstand larger rainfall events while providing passage of aquatic organisms in all seasons. This tactic helped to manage multiple stressors related to a changing hydrology and was proactive to avoid failures in high risk areas given more extreme events. This tactic was actually tested sooner than expected with an extreme event in 2016 that yielded a 500 plus year event Fortunately, a large majority of the redesigned culverts survived the storm. So, you know, this was a really quick tour of the toolkit and examples of how land managers are coping with and intentionally responding to climate change in their project plans. You can find more stories like this on our website where there's a lot more information, including 100 stories like this one. You know, we're grateful that managers have been willing to share their story with us and we feel that these stories paired with the adaptation tools that I've walked you through today are great examples of how to conceptualize what adaptation looks like in a variety of circumstances and landform types. So go check it out at our website. So in closing, you know, there is no one size fits all solution to climate change. We really do need to be adaptive to our location and the values and perspectives of our location. But at the end of the day, it's the same job that we've already been attempting to, to do over several years now, which is, you know, managing stressors, but those patterns and agents may change over time. And we are recognizing that watershed hydrology will reflect, you know, watershed responses to climate and land use change. It is really important to note that we can't just take uniform actions across a watershed, that local targeted actions are necessary in order to prepare these systems for changing conditions. So it's critical to think about the place that we're working in, the objectives that we have within the context of the risk and the values that are also part of that equation in that project site. So I want to thank you for hanging on with me and please get a hold of me at my email address if you have any questions and, and visit our website to find the full publication of adaptation strategies and approaches. Thank you.